Yeah, my name is uh, Sid Wilson. I uh, presently live in Sault Ste. Marie. I live in Haiti and I enjoyed a lot of good years of fellowship out here. And I find it uh, kind of a real pleasure and a privilege to come here and fill in for uh, Steve as he's traveling away down south. Uh, as you know, we're going to be looking at the book of Daniel. And if you could, turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. It was nice to uh, get acquainted with a lot of old friends, and it was nice to see a lot of new faces out here. Some surprises for me, and it was good. So if you're with me in Daniel chapter 5, we'll just uh, read the chapter and uh, make a few comments afterwards. Daniel chapter 5. Balchazar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords, and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. <coughs> then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise man of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom Found in him, and King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an, as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in his Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel? Who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you, that you can give interpretation and explain enemas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men, 
His heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your Lord, your wives and your concubines, have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Many, many tekel you farsen. This is the interpretation of each word. Many is numbered. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the commandment, and they clothed Daniel with purple, and put a chain of gold around his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Probably the shortest length of time between a prophecy and its fulfillment that we're going to find in the Word of God. One of the major themes in the book of Daniel is that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of heaven. And as we, we as you're going to read through the book of Daniel, you're going to find this is a prominent theme. That God is going to impress upon our minds He's the ruler of heaven and of earth. And Daniel is a good book to read when you think that God's lost all control of all things. You know, you uh, we live in an age where uh, we get news from across the world in seconds. And nobody's unaware of the fact of the war that's going on in Kosovo. I mean, every news channel carries a disaster that goes on there. You see the hundreds and thousands of refugees that are being pushed out of Yugoslav and living uh, in tents, and some of them aren't living in tents, some of them are just living on the ground. They have no food, they have no water. And you look at all these situations, and you think, who's controlling all this? Or is there anybody out there that can do anything about it? And the book of Daniel is good to know. Because despite all that goes on, as Daniel wrote about this Nebuchadnezzar, he had the power to execute. He had the power to put down who he wanted to put down, to raise up who he wanted. God is in charge. He's in charge of all the circumstances that go on in this world. As well, he's in charge of all of our lives as well. Daniel was just this young Jewish boy that was ripped out from his home, and he was carted about 400 miles east. And you would have thought, if you would have seen that situation on the news, that this tribe came in and carted this young kid off, you would have thought, well, nobody's in charge here. Things are out of order. And yet, when we look at things from heaven's perspective, when you see it from God's perspective, things are not out of order. Things are not out of order. Sin has certainly corrupted men. And certainly sin has causes damage in this world, but things are not out of his control. As we're well aware of, there were three deportations. There were three times in the lives of, of the Jewish nation that Babylon would come by and take a whole bunch of nations away. And um, it was during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar that these things happened. And Nebuchadnezzar reigned for 43 years. And then Balchazar would reign after him. Now, Jeremiah 27, verse 7. If you turn with me in your Bibles, and uh, there, just for a minute. Jeremiah 27, and verse 7. Because Daniel chapter 5 is actually the fulfillment of this verse. 
Okay? In Jeremiah 27, verse 7, we have the prophecy. And in Daniel chapter 5, we have the fulfillment of this verse. This is during one of the deportations in which Jehoiakim was uh, king. And this would have been the uh, first deportation in 605 B.C. But yet there's this prophecy. I'll begin, in verse, uh, begin reading in verse 6. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. And the beast of the field I have also given him to serve him. So all nations shall serve him and his sons and his son's son. That's the grandson. His son's son. Until the time of his land comes, and then many nations and great kings shall make him serve them. There was going to be a changing of the guards. Jeremiah had predicted that Nebuchadnezzar would come in, but his son's son would be the last ruler in that nation, and Belshazzar is that last ruler. He is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and he would be the last ruler. And so Daniel chapter 5 actually ends up being just the fulfillment of that prophecy in Jeremiah 27 and verse 7. Belshazzar reigned from 553 to 539 B.C. He reigned for a period of 14 years. For a period of 14 years he ruled before the Medes and Persians would overthrow his government. But for now, a couple of comments. In the first four verses, we have here the wickedness of Belshazzar. And we really should note the uh, progression downwards in, in the writing of this book anyway. In the first verse, we have just a hint of a, a little immorality going on. It says, and the king made a great feast. And you know, there's good reason to have a feast. Weddings, birthdays, retirements. There's lots of good reasons to have a feast. But these political feasts were, were more than just a, a gathering of people to get together and have a good time. There were always a show of power and a show of prestige. We can remind ourselves in Genesis chapter 40 when Pharaoh had a feast. He had a, he had a birthday party as well. And there it was that he restored the chief butler to his position and he hanged the baker. It's always a matter of power and prestige. Herod had a birthday party as well. And he invited all his lords and heads of state to the party. And what did he do there? He ended up chopping off John the Baptist's head. And so he starts with a, a party. He starts with a little bit of immorality. And then it degenerated into arrogance. In verse 2, he asked for the silver vessels and all the vessels of the temple to be brought in. Wine is a mocker, it says, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So, obviously, in the party, and one thing led to another. And his arrogance got the best of him. And then his arrogance led to him abandoning God. Because then he worshipped the gods of gold and silver, bronze and wood. You know, we need to be careful as well in our own lives that we're not caught in that same trap as well. We have to realize the things that we do, they can lead farther on down the road to uh, us falling away from the Lord. And we have to be careful that we don't get trapped as well into being arrogant. We need to check our lives so that we don't follow down the road because it's not far when you get down that road that all of a sudden you're going to abandon God. And so he's in the midst of this party, and all of a sudden the writing of the wall appears. And it's significant here that the writing of the wall in verse 5, it says it's opposite the lampstand. The lampstand was that golden lamp that was put in the tabernacle. It was shone on the right-hand side over top of the showbread. The lampstand provides light and illuminates an area. Psalm 119 Verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, the word of God, it gives clear direction for our lives. It gives us a, a means by which to make decisions. 
how we ought to behave towards one another, towards our spouses, towards our children, towards our government, and how we should conduct ourselves as well in the house of God. In the area of prophecy, it details a plan of God from creation to recreation. He created the world, and at the end of the book of Revelation, he's going to recreate it. And there we're going to live eternally. And as the writing was put up, the king was troubled. He couldn't read it. And I don't think it was because he couldn't read the words. It was written in Aramaic. I don't think he could. I don't think it was a matter that he couldn't understand the letters. More, I don't think he could understand the sense of the letters and the meaning of them. So the king had a solution: bring in the wise men, bring in all his soothsayers and astrologers, and bring in all the intellectual people of the day. Bring them all in and get them to read the writing on the wall. And you know what? They couldn't read it. They couldn't read it. Have you ever asked someone when you witness to them if they've ever read a Bible? Have you ever asked them? Have you ever read a Bible? Because they're so sure about some of the things they believe. And right away they give you an answer like, well, who can understand that book? You can't understand that book. It's not beyond you. They can read anything else and understand it. But when it comes to the Word of God, they draw the blank and they can't understand it. I was witnessing to a couple of guys at work last week. And, uh, you know, they're so sure about some of the things they believe. I, w I was condemned because I was eating meat on Good Friday. And I said, well, show me in a Bible where it is. Show me where in the Word of God I can't do this. I can't read it. Well, it's only words. Actually, I was told 75% of the words in the Bible are five letters or less. Not very difficult. The toughest time you're going to have is with the names. The rest of that is pretty plain English. So the words are written. The king brought in his astrologers and he couldn't make sense of it. And I wonder if Paul had this story in mind when he penned these words. And these words are actually from Isaiah 29, verse 14, but he rewrites them in 1 Corinthians 19. He says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? If not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness, foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know, they couldn't understand the writing on the wall. And yet God has picked a very simple message for the world. Jesus Christ has died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again three days later. And if you put your faith and trust in him, you'll have eternal life. Well, the king didn't get anywhere with his wise men, so the queen had a solution. Now, ladies, this is where you're right. This is where you're right. She goes, bring in Belshazzar. Bring in Belshazzar. Now, why didn't Belshazzar know about Daniel? Why, why of all people, Daniel, when Nebuchadnezzar uh, was troubled and he couldn't understand his dreams, he brought in his wise men. They couldn't give the interpretation. And uh, Daniel, and they were all to be executed then. Daniel was out of a elite group of learned young men, and he was supposed to be executed as well. And he says, uh, time out here. Hang on one minute. Uh, before we all get executed, let me and uh, let, give us a chance to interpret this uh, dream that you're not going to tell anybody. So Daniel was brought in, and he interpreted the dream. You've already probably gone through that chapter. And he was given a high position in the government. But why would this Belshazzar not know about him? Well, number one, Daniel kept a low profile as he went about the king's business. Later on in the book, Daniel was just going about it says, the king's business. He didn't really make a want to make a name for himself, but he was just doing what he had to do. And this Belshazzar probably didn't even know he existed. I can imagine 
And, uh, and even in the paper mill, I don't know everybody that works there. I don't know everybody's name. I don't know what they do. Now, go to steel, you could work at one end of the mill and never, ever see another guy on the end of the mill. The other end of the mill. You never know him. And in big uh, governments, I would imagine that uh, with all the people that work there, it's not hard that you wouldn't know somebody in all the business. Another reason why this Belshazzar might not, not have known about Daniel was this place, this takes place 14 years into Belshazzar's reign. This is the last year, this is the last day that he's going to rule. And Daniel now is about 70 years old or better. And the events that made Daniel famous happened 55 years before. I mean, we read them in one couple chapters. But there's a 55-year gap between chapter 1 and where we are right now in chapter 5. And Daniel, for the last 12 years, has been really uh, low profile and there really hasn't uh, been a lot happening. The other thing is, that Charles was drinking. No doubt he's hammered out of his skull and he doesn't, he's not clued into what, what's happening around him. But this one thing, this is a lesson for us. Daniel's past record opened the door for the present opportunity. Okay, Daniel's past record that the queen knew about him, and she said, bring in him, because he knows what's going on. And uh, there's a lesson for us in there as well. You know, he lived a long time in sort of obscurity, and yet when God needed him, he was there. And his record wasn't tarnished from the past. And we have to keep our records good. Keep our records good. Because it's those past records that are going to reflect on our present opportunities. So Daniel brought in before the, before the king. And he comments about Daniel and who he was. And he makes this offer to Daniel in verse 17. And Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another, yet I will read the writing to the king. You know, the king had made a great offer to Daniel. Here, Daniel, you do this for me. Read the writing on the wall, and I'll give you gold, silver. I'll give you a prominent position. I'll do all these things for you. And Daniel says, I don't want it. I don't want it. He refuses the rewards. One of the biggest criticisms the unsaved have about Christians and the Christians they know are about are the televangelists. The biggest criticisms they have about them is their extreme wealth. Their extreme wealth. It's a stumbling block. Daniel just says, I don't need your money. I don't need your position. And I don't need your fame. And we Christians as well need to be known for doing things without having to get paid for them, so to speak. Then there's this warning, this warning for the king, beginning in verse 18. He reminds him of his father's dealings with God. Nebuchadnezzar, his father, was grandfather, was taught a lot of good lessons by God. He had been punished. He had been made to eat like an oxen in the grass. And Yep, Belshazzar just kind of reminded him, listen, remember where you're at? Remember what your father did? And it says he never learned his lesson from his father. He never learned his lesson from his father. Now, his father may not have, his grandfather may not have been the perfect example. And we as Christians may not have perfect examples in our fathers as well. But we can learn lessons from them. We can learn the, the lessons, the things to avoid, and the things to do. We can learn lessons from our parents. And the other thing we have to be careful about is that we don't become their judges. So we don't become their judges. We need to be warned about that. In verse 23, in verse 22, but you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. He knew all about him, and he didn't humble his heart. 
we're told it says, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. The Jews in the wilderness, they're there for an example to us. They're a warning to us as well. That we need to learn from the past. We need to learn not to tempt God. We need to learn not to murmur. Because we're told in verse 11, all these things happened unto them, what, for our examples. For our examples. And they are written for our admission, upon whom the end of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. It's easy to criticize somebody else. Extremely easy to do that. But we got to be careful not to do that. We need rather to humble ourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt us in due time. So there's this warning to Belshazzar, and then the writing gets interpreted. Down in verse 25, the writing gets interpreted. And uh, the words are just uh, a repeat of the words as far as the interpretation goes. And this is one of the nice things about the book of Daniel. You're given a prophecy and you're given an interpretation. You don't have to go looking for it. It's right there. And the inscription that was written, and this is the interpretation of each word, many. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Basically, he told him, your days are numbered. Basically, he was down to the last few hours of it. You know, we're given the same instruction as well. In Psalm chapter 90, in verse 12, we're told, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to number our days. Are we doing that? Are we numbering our days and considering how we're going to stand before the Lord? Are we, are we numbering our days and doing all that we can for God today? I don't know if you heard, but last Friday... I think it was Friday or Thursday, uh, Joyce Nort Norton went home to be with the Lord. Dwayne and Joyce uh, lived in Aurelia. They served the Lord there and they did children's ministries. And uh, we actually, uh, last summer, we had them in our home. But uh, she went home to be with the Lord. She had a heart attack and uh, the doctors put on heart medicine. And right after that, she had a stroke. And she was in the presence of the Lord. She numbered her days, though. Their newsletters were full of plans of what they were going to do and the work that they were doing. They made several trips to Romania as well. So now she's in the presence of the Lord. She's one of those bright jewels in his crown, and she's overburdened with the rewards that she's been dropped with. Given, as well as we should be considering as well to number our days. We're told, boast not about tomorrow. It reminds us as well that God has put the governments in power. God has put them all in power and determined their time in office. As you read through the book of Daniel and as you deal with the prophecies later on, you're going to see the succession of nations that would be brought into power and then taken out of power. God has put them all in power. He's even determined their purpose and function. They're there to enforce the law. And the, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. But at the same time, men are responsible. Men, women, and children are all responsible for their moral choices. This Belshazzar, Belshazzar, as he was in power, he wasn't free to do as he chose. He was free to function under God's rule. And he chose not to. He made his own moral choices. And as well as we individuals, we make our moral choices and we make our decisions to accept or reject Jesus Christ as Savior. There are a lot of people under the impression that because Christ died, because he was buried, and that he rose again, everybody's going to heaven. Everybody's going to heaven. But that's not the case. It says, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
The second warning, heckle. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. That is, you're locking in your morals. You're locking in your morals. And it's always, it always looks easy to, it's always easy to look at the other guy and find all kinds of faults with him. But Jesus taught us to do this, judge not that you be not judged. You know that little stick in your own eye? Pull that little stick out before you, pull the beam out before you pull the little stick out of the other guy's eye. It's always easy to, to look at someone else and, and judge them and criticize them. He said, why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Daniel, when he often prayed, often confessed that he confessed his own sins and the sins of the people. He never left himself out of it. There's a solemn warning here, though, as well, to the believer. This Belshazzar was going to be removed from office. And another kingdom would take over that very night. And as well for Christians. You know, we can be removed from office as well. We can be removed from office. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30. Paul writes about some Christians that are sick and some that have slept because they have partaken of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. We need to be careful. We need to number our days. We need to consider our morals as we come to the Lord's table. Because it's not like the Lord can't remove us from our office as well. We're priests to him but as well he can remove us from office and it happened the next word Perez your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians and this is remarkable it wasn't just one kingdom that came in it was two kingdoms that came in and, the, and they split the spoils of the Babylonian nation Perez means to divide, and you parson is just a plural of Perez, if you're worried about the word changes there. And the accuracy of God's prophecy is amazing when it gets down to this point. Number one, it's the grandson that would be the last ruler in this kingdom of Babylon. And then when the kingdom would be taken over, it wouldn't be taken over by one nation, it would be taken over by two nations. And so ends the rule of Belshazzar. And then it's all wrapped up in verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the, Mesede, Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. This prophecy gets fulfilled. It's nice to see it all in one little chapter, how it all unfolds, how God is in control of all things. And then he told Jeremiah 50 years prior to all this happening what was going to happen. And as we look and consider all the turmoil that's in this world, God's in control. He's in control right to the finest detail. He's not just in control of big government. He knows the very hairs on our head that are numbered. He, he knows that little sparrow that fell to the ground. There's not a detail in our lives that he does not know about and doesn't care about. And as Christians, we need to be, be encouraged. God's in charge. He's in charge of the affairs. Who knows who's going to get saved over in Kosovo? There'll be opportunities abounding for Christians to show their love and compassion. As well, he's in charge of the church. You can read a little church history, and it's not long before you realize, boy, there was a lot of things going on in church. A lot of the splits, a lot of the corruptions. But yet, he's in charge. He's in charge of all that. And when this nation, Belchazar, is brought up on Judgment Day, he's going to be brought up and be judged on his morals. 
on what he did and what he didn't do, as well as for us in the church. We're going to stand before the Lord. He's in charge. And because he's in charge, God's no excuse for us not to do our part in any of all this. He's building it up. And one day, we're going to see from his vantage point up in heaven how all things were played out. And then we're going to we're going to sit up there and the tribulation period, believe it or not, is going to unfold below us. And we're going to see the things that are going on in the tribulation period. And we're just going to be amazed. I read a novel over uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Left Behind by Tim LaHaye. He describes in there the lives of a few people that were left behind in the tribulation period. The husband and the daughter of, uh, and uh, the wife and the, the other son were brought up to heaven. This reporter and a few other people. And, uh, you know, the, the, the tribulation period uh, happens and everyone is gone and the Antichrist gets set up and that's where it's sort of the book ends. And then there's three other books after that to the sequel. You know, God's in charge of all those events. We're going to see those all happening from heaven. Lots of people on the earth, they can't make sense of those events. But from heaven, we will be able to make sense of them. And then we're going to cry like the saints are recorded in Revelation crying. How long, O Lord? Holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And the answer was, just rest a little while. Just rest a little while. You know, we're going to be in heaven, and it's going to be just a little while, and he's going to wrap all things up. Right now, things are chaotic. Things are probably chaotic in your life. There's all kinds of, nobody's life is perfect. We all got our problems. Physical, emotional, spiritual, we all got them problems. And maybe it just seems a whole, like, like it's pretty chaotic. But yet God's in charge. God Charles are find that found that out. God was in charge. He thought he'd just ignore God. He just went on with his party. After Daniel gave him the interpretation. He just went on with his life. It had no effect on him. But I pray that as you read the Word of God, that it does have an effect on your life. That it does bring some fruit unto holiness. We might not always see that as we witness to people. I've been in the mill for a long time. I've yet to see some guy get saved. There. I'd like to see that. Will Carey worked in India for eight years before he found a convert there, not after he had translated the Bible into the Indian language. There was more reception there than there is here. But God is in charge. And I trust that. Will not be the same as Belshazzar. We'll not be so proud that we'll not change. And we'll not be so deaf of hearing that we'll not hear God's word. And that might have a change in effect in our lives. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we just thank you for this time to we can gather here. And Lord, take uh, the words that have been spoken and might they have some change affect some changes in our lives. We just, Lord, pray as well as believers that we would have a whole new appreci appreciation of who you are, that you are the God in heaven that is in control of all things. And Lord, as we consider Easter, certainly that scene at Calvary and in the garden would have been a, would have been a sight. And we would have thought that there, the forces of Satan were in control. And yet, Lord, all things were going according to your plan. As they took you and beat you, that was according to your plan. As they drove the nails through your hand and stood that cross up, it was according to your plan. As you died and you were buried, it was according to your plan. Lord, the disciples and all, all thought that it was over. And then, Lord, you were raised three days later. 
You are in charge. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Lord, we have to know that all these other lords are just subject to your working and to your will. Lord, we pray as Christians, as believers, we would subject ourselves also to the mighty hand of God. He could overthrow kingdoms, powers, and authorities. He sets them up and puts them down, but yet, Lord, you wait for us to bend our wills to your will. And then you work with us. Well, Lord, we just pray that part us with your blessing. Give us safety as we travel home now, considering the bad weather. Lord, and that we might consider your place and your lordship over our lives. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ isn't risen from the grave, our faith is in vain. However, God the Father has risen Jesus Christ from the grave. Amen. I would humbly like to come before everyone um, this morning. But first I'd just like to uh, quote you this verse. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. I would like to apologize to everyone because sometimes uh, in my life I don't put my love for God first. And by doing that, I believe it's a sin. And I'm setting a bad example for the people in the community and the people of this assembly. So I ask for your forgiveness. Um, this assembly exists solely because of the will of God and there's nothing that I can do or that any of us can do um, because it's the, Lord's pur it's the Lord's will it's His purpose that He has for this assembly and I uh, I know that uh, I haven't put enough effort in and that's not a very good encouragement to my brothers and sisters, and to the friends around here. Um, so I have a word of encouragement um, to you brothers and sisters and friends this morning. Um, at the last uh, assembly meeting, I'm not sure how many people uh, actually attended, um, concerned the future of this assembly. Um, a couple of uh, brothers mentioned, uh, and, and this I think we have to, you know, give serious consideration. You know how hard they have to work during the week, and um, how it's hard to give a day to the Lord that we can show our love, our gratitude, our respect um, to Him. And uh, I wanted to thank them for the time that they do put in. And. Um, I'd also like to thank the brothers and sisters in this assembly who work hard all week and uh, they managed to free up three or four days out of the week um, to commit to the Lord and the members of this assembly. Um, I see them here all the time and they don't say anything or um, and they give them themselves freely. They don't ask for any thanks and I've never heard them complain about the work that they have to do around here. And uh, they don't mention people who don't. And that's, to me, that's very important. This I believe they do because they put the love of their Lord, my Lord, first in their lives. And they seek glory for Him, not for themselves. Um, it's my belief that these people, my brothers and sisters, can truly be called the children of God. Um, 
I thank the Lord for each of you, and I encourage you um, to keep it up. I uh, I appreciate the example that you set for me, and uh, I hope that uh, my other brothers and sisters recognize what they do and how the Lord works through them, through their commitment. Um, I encourage you, please, come out to the future of this assembly. Allow the Lord to work through your lives and try and make it out to the next assembly meeting. And uh, let's, uh, let's do it to the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen.